This is the story of the operation which began the assault on the continent of Europe. The 9th Troop Carrier Command will transport and resupply parachute and glider elements of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Division and will be prepared to transport elements of the British 1st Airborne Division as directed. The U.S. 101st Airborne Division will begin landing approximately 4 hours and 30 minutes prior to civil twilight on the morning of D-Day to assist the 4th Division in the initial assault and capture the town of Carantan. The U.S. 82nd Airborne Division will land to the immediate west of the 101st for the purpose of preventing the movement of enemy reserves to the east and north. Simple, isn't it? This mission, which reads so easily, calls for an attack from England on the continent of Europe. The Festung Europa, walled in by the formidable defense in depth of the Atlantic Wall. Trapped, bristling with gun emplacements and fortifications. An impregnable barrier, said the Nazis. Combined chiefs of staff decided that frontal assault alone would not crack Fortress Europe. The Atlantic Wall must be vaulted and the cracking process begun from the rear. The initial effort by land, sea and air would be made in this area, spearheaded by troop carrier and airborne forces. But before the D-Day, there must be a number of lesser D-Days. The first large-scale airborne operation was performed in conjunction with the assault on Sicily, 10 July 1943. Taking off from fields in Africa for dropping zones in Sicily, troop carrier units transported by glider and aircraft, units of the 1st British and the U.S. 82nd Airborne Divisions. Almost a year before this operation, a troop carrier group transported a parachute infantry battalion from England to start the invasion of North Africa. But the invasion of Sicily was the first real test for troop carrier units, which had trained in maneuvers in Texas, the Carolinas, and England. The Sicilian operation indicated there was much to be learned about the planning of an airborne operation. Troop carrier aircraft were shot down by friendly forces. Parachute drops were widely scattered. It was a tactical success, however, rich in experience for the units which would later participate in the assault on the continent. The lesson was driven home that more navigation aids were badly needed, that gliders must be landed at slow speeds, that some type of air brake was necessary to decrease the rate of descent of gliders going into small fields that protection for the nose of the glider and rough landing should be provided, not only to protect the pilot, but to facilitate unloading. A technique had to be worked out for gliders landing on water. To the lessons of Sicily was added the experience of the highly successful operation in the Markham Valley of New Guinea, in which troop carrier and airborne forces showed the practicability of a well-planned daylight operation. in the United States, many lessons learned from the operations in Sicily, Markham Valley, and Salerno were made a part of training and maneuvers. The Griswold nose was developed to protect the glider in rough landings. Parachute arrestor was adopted to permit landing the glider in restricted areas. The 
intercom between tow plane and glider was introduced. Blitz landings were out. Glider pilots were taught a slow, constant rate of descent with a slow landing to a precise spot on the ground. Many types of combat aircraft were suitable for towing the CG-4A glider. The B-25 was used. The P-38 performed its task well. And even the PBY became a tow plane. takeoff of the PBY before the glider. Here's a B-17 in dual tow. And a triple tow by a C-54. Airborne aviation engineers trained in anticipation of their probable use for building landing strips and rebuilding bombed airdromes in France. Troop carrier airplanes are converted in a matter of minutes into ambulance ships. And from lessons learned overseas, through the doctrine expressed in War Department Circular 113, employment of airborne and troop carrier forces. Doctrine was put into practice, and Circular 113 became the blueprint for all future airborne operations. Airborne and troop carrier units are theater of operation forces. Their employment must be an integral part of the basic plan made by the agency directing all land, sea, and air forces in the operation. The coordinating directive must be issued in time to allow realistic preparation and training by troop carrier and airborne units for the specific operation. Airborne troops must be employed in mass and the bulk of the force landed in as small an area as possible. The use of highly trained pathfinder teams dropped in advance to mark dropping zones and glider landing zones is essential. Procedures must be prescribed which will ensure that troop carrier aircraft on course at proper altitudes and on correct time schedules are not fired upon by friendly forces. pilots and the staffs of operational training groups which were committed to the United Kingdom were trained in flying procedures of the United Kingdom before they left the state.
flying was emphasized, designed to prevent early detection by the enemy. Air crews had to fly through a corridor of flak, pinpointed by searchlights. Every aspect of operations in the United Kingdom, flying control, air sea rescue, supply, British navigation, weather, all phases of theater training were covered before the units departed overseas. with gliders landing in small fields, similar to the potential landing zones in France. Live loads are in the gliders. specialized tactics. Glider pilots are trained to stay in action with them until evacuated. Supreme Headquarters was formed. The planning phase changed to the manning phase. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force published a standing operating procedure, which was laid on by Allied Expeditionary Air Force and 21 Army Group, the top headquarters of air and ground forces for the assault. Under AEAF were the 9th and 2nd Tactical Air Forces, which controlled American and British troop carrier units. 21 Army Group commanded American and British and Canadian ground forces and the airborne divisions. Orders for the operation had been issued to troop carrier and airborne commanders and their initial studies had been made. Liaison had been established between 9th Troop Carrier Command and the AEAF, 21 Army Group, the Navy, the 9th Air Force, the 101st Airborne Division, 1st Army, 82nd Airborne Division and 1st Airborne Division. This was the chain of command for the airborne operation. The Airborne Planning Committee, headed by the Air Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force, was composed of representatives from all the services involved in the airborne operation, Navy, ground, and air, as well as the Troop Carrier Command and the Airborne Division's concerns. With the greatest airborne effort in history in the making, a steady stream of gliders flowed into England for the coming assault. From the crates in which they were shipped, Shantytown emerged. Service command units have the task of rapid assembly of CG-4As. 
In addition to their normal assignment of 100 CG4As, some groups had to maintain 140 horses with the usual complement of glider mechanics. British ground crews helped assemble their own horse gliders before turning them over to troop carrier. This British horse now belongs to the 9th Troop Carrier Command. Operational training with the Airborne Division started in March, three months before the assault. This time, troop carrier did not have to haul freight. It could concentrate on its combat assignment and train for it. Intensive work was done on column takeoffs and landings and night formation flying. Each group now had 73 aircraft instead of the normal 52. The troop carrier force of three wings and 14 groups contained one experienced wing and five combat-wise groups from the Mediterranean. The last seven of the nine troop carrier groups committed from the States arrived in England between January and March. This system is used to recover gliders from small fields. Three planes in each squadron are equipped for aerial pickup. coordination between ground and air is necessary for accuracy and delivery of resupply containers. These men are pathfinders, a combined team of troop carrier crews and parachute technicians who will drop on objective areas and set up homing devices for the main aerial convoy. Teams consist of nine to 14 technical men and five security personnel. The Pathfinder School, starting without precedent and table of organization and with little equipment, turned out 50 trained troop carrier crews and 260 British and American airborne officers and men by D-Day. Pathfinder airplanes were equipped with every navigational aid used by troop carrier. And the flight crews and airborne teams received 30 to 60 hours training in their use, both in the air and on the ground. British G, similar to the American SS Loran, has no transmitter in the aircraft, but intercepts signals sent at precise intervals from a master station and two slave stations. The difference in time of arrival of these signals is measured and referred to a G lattice chart showing numbered lines of position. The numbered lines corresponding to the measurement is the line of position the aircraft is on the instant the measurement is taken. As an extra precaution, the leader and the deputy leader of each main serial flew aircraft also equipped with G. SCR 717C is used by the Pathfinders and two aircraft in each main serial. The picture shown on the 717 scope, the nearest thing in radar to a regular map, indicates such objects as shorelines, lakes, cities, and convoys, with the range and azimuth of each object. 
the receiving aircraft appears in the center of the scope. When 717C is tuned to a Bupps beacon, the map is not visible. The coded image shown here in the upper left quadrant is the Bupps beacon signal and indicates the range and azimuth of the beacon from the aircraft. The beacons are set up in the DZs by the pathfinders. All troop carrier aircraft are equipped with Rebecca, the close-in radar aid used at ranges averaging 15 miles. Eureka is triggered by the Rebecca transmitter in the aircraft. The impulse, when received, trips the Eureka transmitter, which sends a signal back to the aircraft on a different frequency. The twin Rebecca antennas, by the intensity of signal received on one side or the other, indicate on the scope which side of the aircraft Eureka is on and the range of the aircraft from the ground station. When the signal is received with equal intensity on both antennas, the aircraft is on course. Each Pathfinder team is equipped with eight specially designed polophane lights from which DZ light tees are made. By D-Day, crews who had lived, trained, and were briefed together could navigate under instrument conditions to within 600 to 800 yards of a pinpointed position in unfamiliar territory. From March through May, 35 lower echelon and three full-scale command exercises were held, culminating in a full dress rehearsal for the operation against the continent. The times, loads, distances, and navigational aids were exactly as would be used in the assault. Landing zones were selected for their similarity to those in Normandy, which intelligence showed were 900 to 1,500 feet long and averaged 500 feet wide. Mosaics showed that the objective areas would hold 1,300 gliders. The Normandy fields were bounded by trees 15 to 75 feet high, along with numerous dense hedges. pilots were allowed to choose their own fields, and release was made at heights from 800 to 1,000 feet. Both ideas were impractical. The high release made the gliders more vulnerable to ground fire and sacrificed accuracy. And when each pilot chose his landing field, there were too many conflicting patterns. Following this maneuver, it was decided that leaders were to choose the landing field for the three other gliders in his element, and the release would be made at 400 to 600 feet. enough for practical operational training are used, there are certain to be crack-ups. A compromise must be made between realistic training and the number of gliders which may be expended on the maneuver. One reason the percentage of horse crack-ups was to be so much higher in the actual operation was that a sufficient number were not available for extensive practice in full load landings into small fields. Because of their rugged fuselage construction, most of the CG-4A gliders, which sustain damage upon landing, deliver their loads of personnel and equipment in fighting condition. The order of battle and the plan is given a final check at Advanced Headquarters, 9th Troop Carrier Command.
troop carrier crews, the majority of which had never seen combat, were approaching a state of battle readiness. The final briefing was held near London on the 1st of June, 1944. Groups will take off from their home airdromes and assemble at wing assembly points. They will proceed to the command assembly point at Elko, then to the command departure point at Flatbush. The first 28 serials will proceed from Flatbush via Gallup and Hoboken to IPs on the west coast of the Cherbourg Peninsula. The dotted lines indicate a 10 mile wide corridor in which no aircraft of any type will be fired on by surface vessels. Corridors, altitudes, constant air speeds, and time over fixes must be adhered to because air, ground, and naval forces have been notified of numbers and timing of our aircraft over the route. The route has been chosen to avoid aircraft assembling in UK, main routes of naval convoys, and flak, particularly from the heavily fortified Channel Islands. DZs and LZs are in the area indicated. After passing DZs, serials will proceed to Paducah, to Spokane and Gallup, and will fly a reciprocal of the outbound course. Distances from the various wing assembly points to the DZs are from Atlanta, 282 miles, from Austin, 197, and from Ada, 192. Navigation aids will be distributed as follows. Eureka will be placed in advance at Atlanta, Cleveland, Elko, Flatbush, and on boat markers at Gallup and Hoboken. Pathfinder teams will place Eureka on all DZs and LZs. Only one of each nine aircraft will home on Eureka, since more than this number will saturate the ground set and reduce the range. Box beacons will be placed at Flatbush, Hoboken, and two DZs by the Pathfinders. Occult portable lighthouses, which flash a coded letter, will be placed at Atlanta, Austin, Ada, Burbank, Cleveland, Dallas, Elko, and Flatbush. Holophane lights will be used during the night operation on the boat markers at Gallup and Hoboken and to form lighted tees on all LZs and DZs. The two boat markers at Gallup and Hoboken will be 100-foot boats manned by the Royal Navy and will maintain their exact position in the channel by G. Panels and smoke coated by color will be used on two DZs and two LZs for the daylight serials. Six Pathfinder serials, three airplanes in each, will take off beginning on D-1 at approximately 2200. A Pathfinder serial, illustrated by circled aircraft, will precede the main convoy into the six drop zones by 30 minutes. Troops from the first Pathfinder aircraft will land on the first DZ at 0020 or at H minus four and a half. The first 28 serials, 24 to 54 aircraft in each, will deliver their loads into the DZs during darkness on D-Day morning. The interval between parachute serials will be six minutes. Altitudes of all serials, both glider and parachute, will be Elko 1500, Flatbush 1000, Overwater outbound, 500. The main parachute formation will fly nine ship V of Vs and 18 ship squadrons with 1,000 feet between each nine ship formation. Both troop carrier and airborne decided on this formation as the best for rapid delivery of troops in mass. Radio silence will be maintained except in extreme emergency and Rebecca will be turned off after making the turn at Hoboken until within 20 miles of the DZ to avoid alerting the enemy. All serials will cross the IP at 1,500 feet, descending to 700 at the DZ or LZ. After the drop or release is made, all aircraft will descend to 100 feet, climbing to 3,000 before crossing Gallup. On the return, Gallup to Elko will be flown at 3,000 feet, since outbound serials will be using the same corridor at 500 feet. The first 26 aerials, or 821 aircraft, which will transport all the parachute troops of both the 82nd and 101st Divisions, will complete their drops by 0244.
About the time the first serial of parachute aircraft returns to its home base, two serials, each consisting of 52 aircraft towing CG-4A gliders, will take off from these airfields. The interval between glider serials will be 10 minutes. These gliders will be released over the LZs about 0400, still in darkness, which will conclude troop carrier operations until 1900 of D-Day. The static hookup will be used for all glider marshalling and takeoff. This system, with all tow planes and gliders hooked up and parked prior to takeoff time, enables each combination to take off at intervals of less than 30 seconds. The control procedure used will be the standard sled and jeep combination indicated. The sled and marker, attached to the jeep by a rope the same length as the tow rope, indicates to the tow plane pilot, when he taxis alongside it, that the slack is taken up. The signal man on the sled gives the tow pilot the signal to take off, then the jeep moves back alongside the next tow plane and the procedure is repeated. The glider pattern will be the standard double column echelon to the right with 300 feet separating the double columns. Three minutes from the LZs, the columns will separate so that landing patterns of separate columns will not conflict. The glider will be brought to a landing over the lighted T's, which will be placed in the fields and lighted by the pathfinders 10 minutes before the arrival of the serial. Four gliders make up the element because of restricted visibility and the size of the field selected for the LZs. Meanwhile, aircraft of 38 Group, the British troop carriers, will take off and form along this route after Serial 10 passes Flatbush. Diversionary measures for enemy radar installations will be furnished by British Stirlings, which will accompany our serials to Hoboken. After troop carrier serials turn at Hoboken, the Stirlings will continue the same course and drop window to simulate troop carrier serials. They will then turn into the coast and drop dummy parachutists. The RAF will furnish three screens of four to eight interceptors, each placed to the south and east of the DZs to attack searchlight and flak installations. Day fighter protection of two to three fighter groups for each aerial convoy will be furnished by the 9th Air Force. On D-Day at 1900, five serials, 208 aircraft, towing 36 CG-4A and 172 Horsa gliders will take off and begin releasing gliders into the same LZs about 2100. All gliders will be landed by 2310. The route in this case will be the same as far as Gallup, where a left-hand turn will be made. Serials will proceed from Gallup to Spokane, to Paducah, to the LZs, make a right turn and fly a reciprocal course on the return route. All future serials will follow this route since the beaches will be secure by this time and will afford more protection from ground fire for daytime flight. Altitude from Gallup to the LZ will be 500 feet. On the return, LZs to Gallup will be flown below 500, climbing to cross Gallup at 3,000. On D-Day Plus One, four serials, 200 aircraft towing 48 horses and 152 CG-4As will begin taking off about 0500 and will put the last glider into the same LZs by about 0910. 512 gliders will then have arrived in Normandy. At 0400 on D Plus One, six serials, 311 aircraft with parapacks, will begin taking off with supplies for the two divisions which will have completed their landing when the last glider lands. These supplies will be dropped on the objective area in Normandy within a space of 30 minutes, beginning at 0611. This will conclude the immediate troop carrier commitments on objectives in Normandy with further resupply dependent on the amount our forces can move across the beaches. Due to the movement of two additional German divisions into the peninsula, the 82nd will not land at saint Sever. The 82nd and 101st Divisions will both land around saint mar eglise five miles from the east coast. The 82nd Division will secure the causeways and lines of communication to the north and across the inundated area to prevent enemy reinforcements from being brought to the beachhead. The 101st Division will proceed south and capture Carenton. The forces which will come across the beach will proceed inland to reinforce this vertical envelopment.
Airborne infantry file into buses for their last landborne ride until D-Day. of their barracks until they climb aboard the airplanes and gliders. New equipment is issued. Nothing to do now but kill time. Nothing, that is, but to keep at the peak and await orders. And grab a few moments to read letters from home and write a few lines. But this is business. And you want to be sure you're in business when the time comes. So you take inventory of your stock and trade and keep everything clean and shining and ready. Overnight, the ships blossomed out in their new war paint. On D-2, invasion markings were applied. Another lesson from Sicily. Invasion money revealed the objective. By now, the high command insisted that individuals should know their destination. Hours before takeoff time, parapacks were assembled and delivered to the C-47s. receive their quarters of troops who will cross the beaches and move forward if troop carrier and airborne have done their job. One glider regiment of the 101st was to go in by boat, as were some attached and supporting units of both divisions. The lift, or the required aircraft and gliders, was not available to put them in by air as early as needed. D-Day minus one, and time narrows down. Gliders for the first night's operation are assembled for the takeoff, ready to follow the parachute serials to France. Officers and men of lower echelons are briefed. Speeds will be pathfinders, 150 indicated for the entire course. Parachute aircraft, 140 to the IP, 125 IP to DZ, slowing to 110 for the drop, then 150 for the return trip. Glider pilots are told to assemble at division headquarters after landing for evacuation to England. An airborne general has a final talk with his men. carrier and airborne have their final inspection.
more than a dozen fields, paratroopers march their ships. Parking diagram showing the location of each aircraft has been given the airborne troops. Each pilot has been furnished a list of his passengers. Parapacks are checked. This outfit has enough of Pash blood in its collective veins to justify their haircut. There's a message from the Supreme Commander. You are about to embark on a great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you, and the hopes and prayers of all liberty-loving people go with you. Pilot and crew chief make a final check of the parapax. And here's another final check. This time by the jump master, just before the men go aboard. This trooper will drop his British leg pack loaded with demolition supplies just before he lands. At 
dusk, Pathfinder teams board the ships that will show the way into enemy territory. Nine hundred twenty-five troop-laden aircraft will home tonight on navigation aids set up by these Pathfinders. This is one minute out of one hour in one day in the world's history that has rarely been equaled. These are the first ships to take off in the airborne invasion of Fortress Europe. First Pathfinder ship is airborne at 2154. As the Pathfinders head for the coast of France, other C-47s move into position for their takeoff at the head of the runway. Thirty minutes after the Pathfinders take off, the first serials of C-47s follow on the invasion path. carrier aircraft across the channel, the Allied invasion fleet has already weighed anchor. The ceiling had been forecast as 3,000 en route, clearing at DZ but actually is variable, 500 to 1,000. Visibility is poor. Stand up. Hook up. Ready with the red. Show the red. Stand the door. Ready with the green. Show the green. Go! landed squarely on the German 91st Infantry Division and other enemy troops. These enemy units were on maneuvers and were already occupying their assigned defensive positions. Surprise was gained only by the leading parachute unit, and subsequent serials found themselves under practically continuous ground and anti-aircraft fire while crossing the peninsula and upon landing. 821 airplane loads, 13,000 paratroops were delivered into DZs in less than two hours. The troop carrier had not planned or trained for a night glider landing, but more panzers moving into the peninsula made 100 glider loads of anti-tank guns and troops essential for the initial phases. It was estimated that only 50% of personnel and equipment would be available for use after the landing. This calculated risk was accepted. The serials were made up of the reliable CG-4As 
which were easier to put into strange fields in darkness. Zero, 0200. Time for the gliders to go. figured. The main trouble was the landing zones were not secured by the time we arrived. In fact, I'd say that 90% of the gliders received hostile fire before landing. The lighting aids were a little messed up. Our group was supposed to have two. I never did see but one, and it was out of place. I understand, though, that some of the Pathfinder teams were neutralized. Defenses are softened up for the beach landing. Daybreak. The naval bombardment continues. Last enemy coastal installations. Priority number one, air supremacy. It had been obtained a long time before D-Day. The 8th and 9th Air Forces had accomplished that. Standing offshore, the invasion craft wait as Allied planes blast the coast. surface ships come in. isolation of a battlefield, and the battlefield is isolated. No German reserves come through to the coast in any strength. The beachhead holds and grows as the Air Force piles up a record number of sorties. Blast every target that moves on enemy ground. Any target of opportunity is legitimate prey. 
Record sorties are flown by the fighters on D-Day. Back in England, the next glider serials are being marshaled for the takeoff. The C-47s are doing double duty. Back from the paratroop drops, they're ready to take off with gliders. Dual tow had been practiced in the States, but it was not used in this operation due to the extra time necessary for air assembly and to the additional marshaling space which it would require on the airdromes. Hard-pressed paratroopers who went into action in darkness earlier today are depending on reinforcements and heavier equipment, which will be delivered by these glider serials. Three groups of fighter cover are in takeoff position at airdromes to the south. coordinated British effort was made simultaneously by the British 6th Airborne Division, transported by RAF 38 Group on objectives around Kong. Particularly interesting was the delivery of eight and one half ton tanks of a recce regiment in 30 huge Hamilcar gliders. 29 of the 30 tanks were in action within 10 minutes after they were landed. is made at the command assembly point.
air superiority makes possible this daylight operation. ACAC ended a mission for this friendly airplane. As these gliders and their tow planes head into France, C-47s which already have dropped their gliders pass on their way back to England. Two-way traffic it's congested. flooded by the Germans. Parachutes and gliders from the previous serials. Gliders cut loose from their tow planes. We have fighter cover all the way to the landing zone. Not even a lone German fighter was able to sneak through. gliders makes a landing in the flooded area. Here are the staked fields intelligence warned us about. The traps consisted of poles 12 to 15 feet long. planes crashed and burned, but actually the C-47 suffered few losses. Some of the glider landings were rugged. 
so is some of the paratroop landing. There were plenty of dummy German guns around. But just as many of the real thing. The men who landed here won't forget this meadow. Resupply ships took off simultaneously with the last glider serial from five airfields which were designated as takeoff fields for resupply by air. All resupply was directed by the Allied Expeditionary Air Force Headquarters through an agency called KTOR, Combined Air Transport Operations Room. Packing, delivery, loading, and lashing of all supplies for aerial delivery was the job of the service command. Requests for air resupply were approved by the Army Group or Air Force in the field. Supplies are dropped. Meanwhile, the airborne infantry had fanned out and taken initial objectives, most of them after hard fighting and heavy losses. Now they're moving through the key town of saint mary On the beach, landing strip number one is built immediately. Protect the field from enemy strafers. D plus four. On the still incompleted strip troop carrier begins evacuation of the wounded to airdromes convenient to base hospitals in England. These wounded were the first to land and the first to fight on D-Day.
blood plasma is supplied before the ships take off. Within two hours, these men will be under expert care, far from the front. Marigliese is well to the rear. On the edge of town, another landing strip is hacked out. Even before the landing mats are laid, a resupply glider comes in with more equipment. turned bad, and it was impossible to move supplies across the beaches. But the army which had landed had to be supplied. Back in England, troop carrier is assigned the job of getting it to them. make the trip along with shells for allied guns. By troop carrier made the difference between a continued assault to Carentan, utilizing the elements of surprise and enemy disorganization, or a stalled offensive, helplessly waiting for supplies bogged down by weather. The landing strip at Saint Marie handled the traffic for resupply.
and trucks are lined up at the field waiting to rush the supplies to the front. As soon as the ammunition is unloaded, the wounded will be brought aboard. Gliders used on the first day's operation and those used in resupply are towed back to England. Inaccessible spots, tow planes use an aerial pickup to get the gliders back home. Others, not flyable, will be disassembled and hauled back by boat. and 101st Airborne Divisions were in action 33 and 24 days, respectively. The 82nd, having captured saint mary Glisse and secured the bridgehead across the Mer de Ray River, destroyed other river crossings, protected the flank of the 7th Army Corps, and drove west to the Douve River. The 101st seized the areas assigned it, destroyed bridges, and drove on to Carentan to establish a defense area there. Troop carrier, the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division sent this commendation. Under most difficult conditions, including landing under fire in enemy occupied terrain, glider pilots did a splendid job. On the ground, they rendered most willing and effective service, providing local protection for the division command post during the most critical period when the division was under heavy attack from three sides. Please express to all elements of your command who brought the division in by glider or parachute, or who performed resupply missions for us, our admiration for their coolness under fire, their determination to overcome all obstacles, and for their magnificent spirit of cooperation. This is part of the price paid for 6 and 7, June 1944. Sixteen hundred sixty-two troop carrier airplanes were dispatched in the first 24 hours of the assault. Forty-three were lost and 311 damaged by small arms fire. A lot happened here that cameras could never get. But a corporal with the Pathfinders remembers. We were covering the landing of the first bunch of gliders. We were pinned down by German fire across the field. As the men came running out, they stepped right into it and started to drop all around us. A German cannon blew one glider right apart. A veteran glider pilot. A night glider operation means more landing casualties and extreme difficulty in unloading. It is certainly not desirable if a dawn or dusk landing is at all practicable. A power pilot. I flew in a parachute serial the first night and the navigation aids really worked but I couldn't see the light T, which was supposed to be on my drop zone. Bups was used very little because Rebecca and G worked so well. 717 was used to check landfall and general position, but that's about all. The War Department observer who entered combat with one of the airborne divisions. Troops were dropped generally in the vicinity of the DZs, but were badly scattered. It appears that prearranged supply systems are not flexible enough for airborne combat. 
Supplies should be dropped as called for by local commanders rather than dropped in mass. Large-scale parachute resupply drops are wasteful and should be restricted to emergencies. More attention should be paid to switching over to ground supply as soon as possible. A troop carrier liaison officer. Our Pathfinder teams, in two cases I know of, suffered heavy casualties. Eureka was installed in every case, at times with the Pathfinders flat on their stomachs, pinned down by enemy crossfire. The light tees, which we expected so much help from, were only 10% operational due to enemy fire. 50% of the resupply drop landed in enemy hands. Communications didn't exist to advise later serials of changes in the enemy situation. Troop carrier operations and communications personnel should move with the first parachute or glider units. 89% of the horses and 50% of the wackos crashed in landing. But 75% of personnel and equipment were ready for combat. Back from Normandy, these men would have faced further tests. How much they had learned will be history. History made by an airborne army.